Good afternoon, everyone. It's noon, and so I'm going to get started. My name is Linda Roth, and I'm the Curator of European Decorative Arts at the Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of Art in Hartford, Connecticut. Join me today on a, gallery, a virtual gallery talk through our current exhibition, Savor, A Revolution in Food Culture, which was curated by Meredith Chilton and organized by the Gardner Museum in Toronto. Sabre tells the story of food culture in 18th century France and England through ceramics, glass, silver, paintings, and books of the period. The exhibition starts in the kitchen garden and proceeds to the farm, hunt, and marketplace, then into the kitchen, to the pantry, and finally to the table. As you walk through the exhibition, either virtually or in person, think about your daily experiences with food culture today our love affair with cookbooks and online recipes, celebrity chefs, food networks, blogs, social media postings of food, farm to table, and vegetarianism. Many of these aspects of food culture, absent the internet, have their roots in earlier times, which you'll see throughout the exhibition. We start our tour in the kitchen garden. In the second half of the 1600s, New garden, gardening methodologies developed that we don't think twice about today, but that transform the kitchen garden, enabling fruits and vegetables to grow in colder climates or for longer seasons. Walled enclosures, like you see here in this in illustration in Diderot's 1771 encyclopedia, were built to protect plants from cold winds and frosts while creating a backdrop for trained fruit trees. And you can see them trained on the back uh, walls of this garden. Raised beds filled with hot manure encouraged early growth of seedlings, which were then protected by glass or straw covers. And you can see them um, also in this illustration. One notable incident may have had a hand in spurring on the gardening revolution. In January of 1660, King Louis XIV of France was given a basket of fresh peas brought to him from Genoa, Italy by a French spy. Remember that at this time, vegetables and fruits were very seasonal and very local. Louis was so taken by being able to eat peas in January that they became, they became the rage at the French court. It may have inspired him to hire Jean-Baptiste de la Cantigny to be director of the vegetable and fruit gardens at the Palace of Versailles in 1670. De La Cantigny, who had worked in Italy, transformed nine acres of land close to the chateau into highly productive kitchen gardens, acclimatizing tender fruits such as melons and figs, and encouraging fruit and veg fruits and vegetables such as the king's favorite peas to grow earlier and for longer seasons. The king's love of peas also inspired the curator of the exhibition, Meredith Chilton, to name the exhibition's catalog, The King's Peas a cookbook with stories about the period, culinary insights, and 30 recipes adapted from those found in 17th and 18th century cookbooks. By the 18th century, expanded trade both in Asia and the New World brought all sorts of new foods to Europe. Globalism is not just a 20th and 21st century phenomenon. One of the most exotic foods to come was the pineapple, which was coveted by European nobility and horticulturists alike. Known by Europeans from the 1600s, these delicate fruits could not survive the long voyage across the Atlantic, and the plants needed very warm growing conditions to thrive in fruit. It took over 200 years to develop specially designed hothouses and growing methods that enabled Europeans to grow them. Even then, pineapples were still so rare and expensive the confectioners rented them out to be displayed at grand dinners and made ice creams in pineapple molds to delight guests. The pineapple was also a celebrity fruit in colonial America. The ability to have a pineapple to share with guests transformed into the pineapple becoming a welcome symbol displayed on architecture and furniture. Pineapples still inspire artists today, like English ceramist Kate Malone, whose jug seen here is a marvel of naturalism and creativity. Kate will be doing an online artist talk on Tuesday, October 13th at 4 p.m. 
you will be able to find the link on our website closer to the date. The second section of the exhibition explores food from the farm, what was eaten through hunting, and what was available in the marketplace. Cities and town had, towns had public markets where farmers, fishermen, and tradesmen and women offered their products. In large cities, markets might be specialized with one devoted to produce, one to meats, and one to fish. A particular note are all the new foods that came into Europe from the Americas and sold in major markets. Potatoes, tomatoes, chilies, turkeys, chocolate, squash, pineapple, and sugar. While some like the tomato and potato took until the 19th century to catch on, others like sugar and chocolate transformed eating and drinking in the 17th centuries. Porcelain factories like Meissen in Germany and Sev in France made charming sculptures of market sellers that were destined to the dessert table, as you'll see in a few moments. The lovely white figures on the screen here were made at Sev. Wild and domestic fowl were also important food sources. People ate a wide variety of wild fowl, including game birds like quail, partridges, and woodcocks. They also ate, which is a bit strange to us, songbirds like sparrows, finches, larks, and blackbirds. Remember the nursery rhyme, four and 20 blackbirds baked in a pie? Turkeys were brought from the New World by the Spanish in the 16th century, and by the 18th century were easily bred and available. There are accounts of herds of turkeys being walked to London from Northern England, their feet tarred to protect them on their three month journey. Pigeons were bred for the table and most farms of any size had dovecotes. Pigeon and squab, uh, squab being young pigeons are still eaten, but more in Europe than in America but these are farm raised and not the city pigeons that most of us dislike. You can see many of these birds represented by wonderful terrines in the exhibition, which were fashionable in the middle of the 18th century. On the left is a goose, um, ducks, duck, pigeons, and a wonderful turkey. While on the top right is a pair of woodcocks and below a charming crested duck. The crested duck was brought to Europe from East Asia. While it is tempting to think that these terrines were used at the table, perhaps filled with stews and soups related to their forms, it's more likely that they were strictly decorative. Most are not really functional or well suited for hot foods. They would have needed liners to protect the earthenware pottery and their irregular shapes would have made that challenging. Earthenware is easily chipped and frequent use and washing would have taken its toll. It is easier to imagine a table decorated with these naturalistic marbles and food set out in more functional dishes. While one might think that anyone outside of the cities could provide food for themselves and their families through hunting and farming, in fact, hunting was increasingly restricted to landowners who alone were allowed to hunt game such as deer, boar, and large birds. The poor were limited to snaring small birds and rabbits. Unauthorized hunting could result in imprisonment or execution. Boar and stag hunting in particular were the privilege of the nobility. Recipes of the time call for boar to be cooked in a variety of preparations, including roasting or braising the whole head or encasing the meat in pastry as shown in the cookbook on the, street, on the screen. Presenting a boar's head at the table was an indication of status and possibly a fashion at dinners after the hunt. A boar's head tureen would have been a wonderful and less messy stand-in for the real thing. One thing to keep in mind as you think about meat consumption then is that there was no refrigeration. So meats not eaten right away had to be preserved, either salted, smoked, pickled, or made into sausages and bacon. These ingredients were essential in many dishes of the day and certainly the uh, bacon seems to be uh, essential to a lot of people today. With all of the transformations in the garden, farm and marketplace, 18th century cooks had a much larger selection of ingredients to cook with. Cookbooks were increasingly published and were more organized than ever. Recipes were also more precise. While in France, cookbooks were the domain of men, in England, several important cookbooks were written by women, and there are original examples 
uh, by both men and women in the exhibition. The cooking style of earlier periods, which consistently paired sweet and savory, was replaced by new flavors, such as mushrooms and herbs. Spices like cinnamon and nutmeg moved away from savory dishes to desserts. Large households dedicated multiple rooms for meal preparation. There would have been a hot kitchen and cold rooms for salad prep, desserts, and confections. The highest end of society was able to entertain lavishly. Banquets were multi-course affairs with separate tables set out for the dessert course. These could be decorated with elaborate sugar sculptures, sometimes combined with the new material of the day, porcelain, laden with pyramids of fruit and dishes of sweetmeats. You can see such a table in this engraving with the um, piles of uh, fruits in the form of pyramids and an elaborate, probably sugar um, uh, sculpture or um, possibly a silver, uh, a silver basket. It's actually quite difficult to see at this, um, at this uh, size. The sugar sculptures were prepared in the confectioner's sugar by a specialist. Tools and molds used to make sugar sculptures which were fashioned from sugar paste made with sugar and some kind of binder, often gum tragacanthin, are displayed in the top left image. Here's the mold and some tools, um, uh, um, as well as the Gothic uh, castle. These were all, um, the castle was made by a food historian and master sugar sculptor, Ivan Day, and these are his molds and his tools, uh, specifically for this collection, uh, for this exhibition. Of course, the less fortunate ate much more humbly without the advantage of imported ingredients or um, an updated kitchen. Bread, cabbages, root vegetables, dried beans and lentils were staples. Meat was rare and often soup was the only dish served in a day. Like today, salads were an important part of 18th century cuisine. The French preferred simple salads made of one ingredient, which was sometimes fruit, but also fresh picked greens dressed in a vinaigrette. And exa examples include lettuce, cucumbers, asparagus, radish, oranges, and even lemons. On the screen, you see a beautiful English cruet set with casters for pepper, um, mustard and sugar, and bottles for oil and vinegar. Salt was served in small containers, often ceramic or glass, rather than in casters. Its corrosive effects on silver were such that casters were highly impractical. And here you see a French 18th century um, spice set uh, from the Chantilly porcelain factory. And these small shallow wells would have been for uh, spices and salt um, and possibly mustard in the center pot. What might be surprising to us is that there were proponents of both vegetarianism and farm to table in 18th century France and England, including advocates for consuming foods from within a relatively small geographic area. This period saw many new advances in the kitchen. Cooking was revolutionized with the move from tripod pots hung directly over the fire to stoves where flat bottom copper pots could be used and heat could be better controlled. Brick stoves like one illustrated here uh, were built with fire chambers below. That's the, these are the fire chambers and holes built into the top of the, um, of the stove to set your pots on. Um, equipment was, and, and you could control the, the heat in these fire boxes and for the most delicate foods like an omelet, you could let the actual fire go out and just the burning embers would have been enough to heat a pan for a delicate omelet. Equipment was much more scientific. Did you know that the pressure cooker was invented in France in 1679? And the first modern thermometer was invented in 1714 by Daniel Gabriel Fahrenheit. Such advances made it possible to cook sauces and much more delicate foods. All of these new foods and preparations prompted the desire for new forms of serving dishes. Specialization began aided by the invention of porcelain in Europe at the beginning of the 18th century, which fueled this growth. 
the idea of a matching table setting was introduced during this period. A new way of serving food on grand occasions also began, which was called service a la Francaise, where dinner was served in a series of courses and the dishes for each course were set out on the table at the same time. The first course in such a multi-course feast included soups and stews served in terrines, a new form in the 18th century. Before the tureen, soups and stews were served from large bowls covered with an inverted bowl and held together by a napkin folded into a strip. And you can see this in an engraving, um, in this engraving in the, on the screen, these gentlemen are actually carrying two um, containers of soup or stew, but you can see how they've um, draped the napkin over, over the bowls. Um, the napkin was um, aided in keeping the bowls together and it also protected their hands uh, from the heat. Needless to say, a covered dish with handles would have been a welcome improvement. Also in the first course were, were roasts and smaller dishes. When the terrines were removed from the table, other meat and fish dishes were brought in to fill the spaces. The second course included less substantial meat and fish dishes, including sweet and savory dishes like vegetables and pastries. And so you see they still hadn't gotten quite away, uh, fully away from uh, combining sweet and savory, but they were in separate dishes, not in the same dish as um, sort of contrasting flavors. On the grandest tables, terrines and silver were made of silver or porcelain and were set out according to specific table plans, like the one you see here. This would have been, as they say, a cover for 16 diners. The third course was the spectacular finale of sweets. The table was set with arrangements of fruits, small cakes, convection, confections, and ices. And you'll recall, I should have put the image back in this slide, but you'll recall that engraving with the pyramids um, on the fruit, uh, on the dessert table. Baskets like these on the screen were filled with such delicacies. The porcelain basket on the left was specifically for marron glace or glazed chestnuts. The explosion of desserts and confections was fueled by the increased access to sugar. Though known since classical antiquity, new world cultivation of sugarcane by enslaved peoples made sugar cheaper and available to people of most classes. As we know, sugar is addictive then as now. The relationship between sugar and slavery is made clear in this painting, A Sense of Taste, by the French artist Philippe Mercier, which shows a young black man with a silver collar, a silver slave collar, pouring wine into the um, glass of one of, a, uh, of two couple, couples who are enjoying a dessert of fresh fruit and syllabub. Uh, syllabub is a light frothy alcoholic cream made with wine, fruit, cream, and sugar. Like the English and the Dutch, the French also participated in the slave trade in the 18th century, sending most captured Africans to their sugar colonies in the new world. But it's clear from this painting and others that a certain number of enslaved Africans were also living in France as domestic servants. The subject of sugar and savory is as complex as it is disturbing and will be the focus of an exhibition at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in 2023 or 2024. Ice cream became popular in the second half of the 18th century. A century before, the knowledge that when salt was added to ice, it would cause liquids to freeze was then applied to making ices and ice creams. Naples was central to developing this new delicacy. And by the late 17th century, the craze was brought to France. Ices and ice creams came in a wide variety of flavors, some familiar such as pistachio, chocolate, and strawberry, and other more surprising like Parmesan cheese and truffle. Ices were often molded in different shapes to make dramatic presentations at the temple, at the temple, at the table. And you see an image of um, molded ices that was made um, by Ivan Day, our food historian um, and sugar sculptor. Pineapple molds were very popular. You see uh, one here. Um, 
just remember how uh, rare and precious a pineapple would have been at this time. There were even molds in the shape of vegetables like asparagus, and there's one in um, the exhibition here, uh, which must have brought dessert uh, humor to the dessert table. Ice cream was also brought to the table in coolers, like the one in the upper right, which were sold with French dessert services. Comprising three parts, the ice and salt were placed in the bottom. Below a liner, uh, this is the liner right under here, that was filled with the ice cream. More salt and ice were placed in the well um, of the cover. Ice cream could actually stay frozen like this uh, uh, for three hours. If you want to learn more about the history of ice cream and how it was made in pre-industrial times, go to the Saver page of our website under exhibitions and click on Ivan Day's lecture um, or on second Saturdays for September 12th to find his ice cream demonstration. At the highest levels of society in the 17th century, dining was highly staged and formal. With the end of Louis XIV's reign, and especially during the reign of Louis XV, the court and nobility craved opportunities for more informal dining. The final section of the exhibition presents various meals that might have taken place, from breakfast to picnic lunches, to meals on the road, to intimate evening dinners. In the interest of time, I'll take you through just three of them today. Breakfast, unlike today, was usually taken in your room as you dressed, saw your children, or received visitors. And you can see um, a, a young woman uh, with her children probably brought in by the governess taking her morning chocolate. Imported foods like chocolate and coffee were often consumed during this meal. Cups were sometimes set in saucers that had either a raised gallery like this Dupacier um, example from uh, Vienna or in a sunken well to keep the cup from moving while being served. Broth was also taken at breakfast, served in covered bowls with handles like this one also from the Dupacier factory. The afternoon was the perfect time for tea, then as now. Special equipage was made by silversmiths and European porcelain factories for coffee, tea, and chocolate. Silver kettles on, a, on stands with a place for a small burner kept water uh, for tea hot. Uh, you can see a beautiful English example in the Wadsworth's collection and in the exhibition. A concentrated brew of tea was placed in the small teapots and the hot water from the kettle was used to dilute it when poured into a cup. The Meissen factory specialized in making large services with multiple cups and saucers, tea caddies, sugar bowls, milk jugs, tea and coffee pots. And they were often sold in these specially made leather boxes for easy transport and storage. Then as now, dining and romance were interconnected. And like today, certain, certain foods were specifically associated with enhanced virility including eggs and oysters. Even chocolate, coffee, and tea were marketed this way when they were first introduced into Europe, an ingenious way to promote unfamiliar foods. For private dinners, small tables were set up next to the dining table where glasses and wine were kept for diners to help themselves without the assistance of servants. And you can see such an, uh, such an arrangement in this engraving where you have a small table and right here there's a wine bottle set into the table and a, a, a wine glass cooler, and then there are dishes on the bottom so that the guests can really serve themselves through their whole meal. Well, I'm gonna sneak back here. Um, I don't have a slide of it, but I do wanna tell you that the, um, and so this is to entice you to come. The, at the end of the exhibition, we have a wonderful vignette of contemporary, um, it's a contemporary vignette with, uh, um, with uh, chairs uh, specifically made for the exhibition and a small table set with a fabulous uh, centerpiece made by the contemporary ceramist, Chris Antiman, um, who has had several uh, intern, not internships, residencies at the Mice and Porcelain Factory. So if you want to um, come and see the exhibition, um, 
uh, please don't miss this last section. I hope you've enjoyed this little taste of savor. There's much more to be learned and enjoyed in the exhibition. So if you're in our area, please come to see it in person. We're giving tours of the exhibitions on Wednesdays and Sundays, or stroll at your leisure Friday through Sunday, noon to five. Please visit our website for times and COVID protocols.